Hello and welcome to my talk about advanced misuse of mostly open SSH. I hope everybody is understanding all right. If I talk too slowly or too quickly, please raise a hand, um, shout something at me and I might react. Um, if you don't understand anything at all, then I'm sorry. Um, please follow the slides. <laughs> The outline is as follows. I want to do a quick introduction to SSH because some people maybe don't know all the details, maybe they don't feel so comfortable, they maybe use putty all the time, I don't know. Uh, so just a quick introduction to get everybody up to speed. Then I'll do, um, I'll show you some ways how, how you can tunnel through SSH because that is very usable if you um, try to keep uh, some infrastructure in check or maybe you want to connect uh, back home uh, through some NAT um, or many other use cases there. Maybe you want to leak some data from your company. I, I don't know. I'm not liable for anything I tell here. Uh, please um, don't tell I told you. <laughs> um, there are some SOX proxy options in uh, OpenSSH. Uh, so I, I want to show you that. Um, I want to talk about open, uh, about open VPN alternatives that you can actually implement using uh, SSH in mostly okay way, but it's a bit hacky. Um, I'll tell you something about limiting logins because that is quite important if you, if you are trying to set up some tunnels. Um, maybe you just want a user to set up a tunnel but uh, don't do anything else. Um, if I have some time left, um, I, I will talk about some crazy stuff, some ideas maybe that you can follow, but I, I will not go in, uh, in the details there. Just the overall idea that it exists, that you can look it up. Uh, and I would like to talk about some resources that I find interesting, where you can read a lot more about these topics than I can ever tell you. Um, also, I, I would be very happy uh, if you just shout something in, if you, you know, show, show your arm and um, I, I can react. You can ask questions in the talk um, and I would like to make it a bit of a discussion. Maybe you want to stop me in the middle and say, okay, how do you do that exactly and I can show you or maybe I'm... Uh, false and maybe in the new OpenSSH version it's done differently or something else. Okay, so just try to be uh, active or if you want to. So SSH is actually specified in standards, in IETF standards, RFCs uh, 4250, 51 uh, and up to 56. Uh, it is defined as the Secure Shell protocol is a protocol for secure remote login and other secure network services over an insecure network. Um, that's why I will tell you about tunnels. That's the other secure network services uh, part of, of the definition. Some of the widely used implementations are uh, OpenSSH from the OpenBSD project. Um, this implementation works on mostly anything. Uh, it, uh, Microsoft even ported it to Windows and they ship it in Windows and Windows Server at this point. So uh, many of those features I will present you, you can use also on Windows out of the box. There is Dropware that is used mostly on embedded platforms where um, a very small binary is needed and this provides you with most of the options but it has some, some uh, differences. And uh, of course if you like GUIs, if you are mostly on Windows, you probably know Putty and uh, WinSCP. Uh, uh, those are both client ap uh, applications for the 
command line access and for uh, file transfer. Is it readable? Can, can you read some details about it? This is how it looks like if you connect for the first time somewhere. And I show you uh, the options on, on the top. There is IPv, uh, IPv4 uh, connection. Uh, in the middle is IPv6 with global addresses. And, and uh, at the bottom is IPv6, but in linked local addresses. That is very useful if you locked yourself out uh, on IPv4, but you still somehow by auto configuration got the um, link local access. So I actually fixed some infrastructure uh, this way, which was very lucky because I uh, didn't have to leave um, my home. Uh, and of course, in production, you would probably set up DNS uh, names or at least ETC hosts, um, which is also uh, ETC hosts is also on Windows in Windows system 32 or something. So this is how it looks like. Uh, what you see is basically the fingerprint of the remote public key that you should verify. And your administrator should, uh, should tell you uh, the fingerprint by some means or maybe um, send, you, uh, send you the fingerprint by some other channel. Um, or if you are the administrator, you should actually, when you set up a server, write down those uh, fingerprints and then you can compare or you, you, should, um, you should distribute those uh, to known hosts files um, over some uh, configuration management software. Um, or if you feel lucky, uh, then, then you can just say oh yes and continue. So as, uh, SSH introduction in practice, of, of course, you have a client and a server. The server part is where you connect to. The client part is where you connect from. Uh, the SSH server listens normally on TCP port 22. Uh, this can be changed. So maybe uh, if your corporate firewall only allows out, uh, outbound connections on port 443, or port 80 for HTTP and HTTPS, then you could configure your server in the internet somewhere uh, to listen on port 80 and 443 um, at the same time, and then uh, you can connect over to this destination port, and maybe the firewall will not recognize it as a different service than, or different protocol than HTTPS, maybe or maybe the admin will knock you out. Okay. Um, the client can be configured globally in SSH config in the obvious locations, etc, uh, SSH, SSH underscore config. Um, or for each user in the home directory, this uh, is also present on, on Windows, of course, in the home uh, directory now. And, or you can specify those options on the command line. Um, there are more resources uh, on, on the slide. So in general, if you connect from the command line, you type SSH, then the username at IP or host. Uh, in practice, this looks like as I, I am Adam, so I would connect to my server maybe using SSH uh, and Adam at Turis, or that, that would be my router, for instance. Or I would uh, copy files over SCP or SFTP, Ersync, uh, whatever. You can also pipe uh, files uh, through the SSH connection. Most people don't know that, or, um, or, or at least uh, some administrators uh, don't realize that is also a possibility. Okay, to the tunnels. Now it's more advanced. Everybody's awake again. And um, so, local port forwarding. Take a port on a local machine that is a client and use it as a portal for a port on the connection destination, which is the server. So, I take um, on the in 
on the slide you see that I take port 8080 and bind it to the remote port of 80. And this is um, how I could access uh, the web interface on my tourist. Um, if, I, if I'm abroad, if, if, if I just want to log in from the outside to the, to the router and then change something on there, because I don't want to expose the web interface to the world. Uh, you, can, you can do uh, these things also in PuTTY. Um, I'll not delve too much into it. Um, what is it good for? Of course, uh, if you only have access to un unencrypted protocols, then you don't want to send uh, your login information over, uh, over an unsecure uh, connection. So you provide a tunnel and send it through this uh, secure tunnel and basically make it secure. Um, maybe um, you have a device that doesn't support HTTPS or is somehow broken there or somebody else administrates it and doesn't provide HTTPS at all or whatever. Um, you can also um, bind or basically connect to services that, uh, that only run on localhost but on a remote machine. And, um, for instance, some developers might start some service on a local host, on a server somewhere in the cloud, but they want to browse it comfortably uh, through their Firefox or Chrome, and so they would uh, send a connection to this uh, server, and but uh, show everything uh, locally. Uh, you can also provide an ad hoc forwarder for other hosts, uh, on the network where the when, where the client is, um, but beware uh, that uh, DNS is still uh, leaking information. So uh, the DNS um, requests go to the local DNS server, and uh, so so every, uh, anybody who is who is listening there will probably know where you want to go on on the other end. Yes. So if you, if you can do local port forwarding, you can do uh, remote port for, forwarding also. This is um, uh, turned upside down, basically. Um, it, uh, think of it as uh, take a port on the remote machine, the server, and use it as a portal for a port on the um, connection source, which is the client. That means I connect to a server, then door, uh, there I um, take a port, and if I connect to this port on the remote machine, then the connection will transparently go back to my local machine and um, do, do something there. Um, you can, uh, by default, it is limited to localhost connections, so you, uh, it will not accept any connections from, from the outside. Um, but you can change that using the gateway option, uh, gateway ports option in SSHD config. Um, so what is this good for? Well, you can make a tunnel through a NAT, uh, a network address translation device, maybe um, a firewall that is very stringently set up, and then, when you are at home or somewhere else, uh, connect back to the inside of the, of the network. Maybe um, you don't realize, but nowadays many providers employ a uh, thing called CGNAT, which is carrier-grade uh, network address, uh, network address uh, translation. So, and that, that breaks up, uh, breaks basically the end-to-end -end principle and um, you cannot easily connect back to your uh, normal uh, workstation at, on, uh, in, in the company or at home or wherever. Uh, maybe you are not allowed a VPN, which would be the other option, how to connect back. 
Uh, you can also use a SOX reverse proxy, then you wouldn't specify uh, the port that it binds to on the local machine. So this, uh, the port uh, 2222, which is an example port uh, for this slide, uh, this, is, this is basically the remote portal port, and uh, everybody that connects to this port gets forwarded to your client and from there dispatched to whatever destination uh, they want to go. Uh, obviously, this can be used uh, also in malware. If, if some malware, uh, on, for, for instance, some Android malware, um, the authors of the malware, they want to connect to those machines and do something, maybe update the client or whatever. And um, yeah, that it can it can get misused. So uh, keep it in mind that you are basically opening up to the internet. Um, be be careful there, please. Uh, of course. Uh, oh, I I'm sorry, I mistyped this one. Uh, it should be uh, D. I can actually I will correct it uh, afterwards, but. Um, uh, on this slide, is, it, should, it should be SSH minus capital D, and then 9,999, and then uh, Adam at I can I can probably show you that, uh, so everybody uh, knows what I'm talking about. And um, Okay, so what I want to do is I want to have a, a SOX proxy um, endpoint on my local machine, and this, I want to, I, I want to use this for uh, forwarding all the connections that I make to this proxy to the destination. Okay, uh, so I can use SSH. Do, do you see anything? Maybe I can make it a bit larger. Is this better? Can everybody see that? Okay. And then I would say, um, sorry, of course I have to specify a port. And then I need to type in some password. And then I'm on the server, uh, or my router at home. And then what I can do, is in my Firefox, I can change the preference to, uh, to use this SOX proxy. And then I can um, run Google, whatever, you know. This, this is very transparent. You haven't seen any trouble with that. Well, I can now turn off the the proxy, and you'll see that the uh, connection will be broke because there is no no tunnel. And well, how 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 would I do that without disconnecting? Well, there is this option to use an escape character. This would be enter tilde and capital C, and then I can change the parameters of the connection. And then I would say um, I want to um, kill the dynamic proxy connection on the port 9999. And then I cancel the forwarding. I'm still connected, yes? But my Firefox tells me, OK, there is no SOX proxy. So well, um, I did. I did that. I could. Um, I could do a remote uh, port forwarding that would basically um, allocate that. That would do what I just presented. Um, that would basically take a port on the remote machine and use it as a portal, and then I could basically log in back here. Okay. Um, 
so I, I, should, I should just that. Maybe I take a different port. Maybe um, I take port 2222. And I want to connect it back to my local host, um, local host machine. And I want to connect it to my uh, SSHD daemon, OK? And then I connect uh, to the to the server. I forgot to um, save the key in my agent. Well, I'm I'm there. So now I should be able to connect back. Okay, SSH to port 2222, and then it's my username and local host, which is which is basically. Uh, implied in front of those 2,222, okay? And yes, I'm connecting back. Um, I, I would now compare the fingerprints. I know this is correct. Well done. And I'm back, okay? So that's it's basically in. So that was that was this. Okay. Well, this is kind kind of all not so convenient. Maybe you want to log in in the morning to your company from home and then just work and uh, don't care about anything else. But maybe you just started and don't have a VPN access at this point in time, or maybe it's prohibited, or maybe there are reasons you you have a Fortinet firewall and the con uh, the open source client doesn't work, and you don't have any Windows at home, and I don't know, uh, and but you still have to work. So I discovered this uh, software as Shuttle. And you can use it in, in such a way that basically it locally installs a module in your IP tables or any firewall you use. And, uh, on, and then creates a tunnel to the remote machine over SSH. And there also implements something in the firewall. And what this gets used uh, for is basically locally you start a connection normally as you would you would do, and transparently there is a rule in IP tables that transforms this connection uh, and creates the same connection as if it would start on the remote client. It is quite complicated, uh, but it works reliably. And you can, you, it's basically a poor man's VPN. You can, by default, it only forwards uh, TCP connections and DNS requests. Those DNS requests basically originate from the remote machine then. Okay, so you have to configure um, DNS correctly on the target machine because the target machine is who, who is asking for DNS then. You can do ping over this. That, that is quite inconvenient, because if you manage uh, some switches or routers, then you ping all the time, and uh, this doesn't work. So keep, it, keep that in mind. But for instance, uh, there, is a uh, there is a piece of software in Nmap, uh, where uh, n ping, and then you can use basically TCP SYN uh, pings, for instance, and that works also. Uh, the software can support UDP with some more effort, but if you just do apt-get install shuttle, uh, then this is what, what would uh, work out, out of the box without any further configuration. Um, also, this, is, this has the advantage that this doesn't do TCP in TCP with all the associated problems with congestion and uh, window scaling. Uh, it creates new 
TCP connections on, on the target machine, okay? So um, I should probably show that. Um, I will try to I'll log in to some. I'll log into my company. Okay. So I have to start the software because I'm doing something with IP tables. I need pseudo privileges that is automatically started from SSH shuttle. Um, I type my password in. Okay. Then I have to authenticate uh, at the jump host of my company. And no, I'm not uh, showing you the password. <laughs> okay, and then, and it should tell me, okay, I'm using IP tables, and because the endpoint I'm connecting to is uh, an old CentOS machine, um, this tells me, okay, uh, you should watch out. But um, I'm, I'm connected now, so I change, you remember I changed my uh, proxy settings, so I changed that back, because I don't need it anymore, because everything is transparently uh, forwarded uh, to, to my company, basically, now. Okay, and you see, our company has some restrictions uh, put in place, uh, so I would need to authenticate on the on the firewall uh, inside. I just show you that basically this is something that is not normal, that is not what you would expect in this kind uh, in this network now, and I would need to authenticate on the firewall. Okay, so I will not do that. Uh, that is, but now you probably believe me that I'm in a different network somewhere else. Okay, and when you are done, then you just kill that and everything is back to normal, okay? So, um, when I go back, then I'm, I'm back at Google or whatever. Here I am. Okay. But no, not everybody has SS uh, Shuttle installed, maybe you cannot install further software. Well, theoretically, you could use uh, OpenSSH VPN. Uh, for that, you need root permissions on both ends. Sudo will not work from what I found out, because sudo um, uh, starts later than this. Okay. Um, OpenSSH VPN only works on uh, Nix operating systems. That is a thing that doesn't work on, uh, in the current implementation in Windows. Um, it uses the TAN interface and basically uh, creates a side-to-side -side VPN. It can, it can do um, layer 2 VPN, layer 3 VPN, um, and there are options for that in SSHD. Uh, in the config file, um, but you should use this as a last resort because um, it, it has the TCP and TCP problems, okay? Um, it can lead to congestion problems um, because the inner TCP uh, segments, they don't, get it, then they don't get lost, okay? Because if, if packets get dropped, on, uh, only the outside connection that takes care uh, of the of the resending of of all the packets that are in the inside TCP connection. So any controls, any congestion controls on TCP don't work because you never lose packets on the inside. Uh, okay, um, but you are still waiting for for um, the packets to actually get delivered. So. This can get broken very quickly. You should probably try to limit the bandwidth uh, with 
uh, traffic control or something else on, on your operating system if you really need this for production purposes. But I would strongly advise you to use WireGuard or open a VPN or something else that, that is uh, UDP based, okay? I'll not delve too much into it, but I have a book here from Michael W. Lucas, and um, this book, there is a whole chapter on SSH VPNs, and uh, you can come, come up to me after the talk, and we can go through it, okay? So, now you want to do tunnels, but you don't, maybe you don't want your users to do anything else, okay? Because um, mostly if you want um, these tunnels created in, a, in an automatic way, those uh, public and private keys, uh, the, the private key is not password protected normally then, okay? And what this amounts to is that if, some, if you had an unlimited access on the server with this uh, login, then if, if the computer gets lost and somebody reads the private key, they can connect to your server and do anything they want. Um, of, yeah. um, also, if you connect to, uh, to the server as root, because you have to because of the VPN, uh, then uh, it's, it would be a disaster. They would have immediate root access with all the permissions associated. So what you can do is, in the man page uh, for uh, ssh underscore um, config, uh, you can, you can uh, go to the authorized keys section, and there you can read the options that you can use to restrict the capabilities when you use this particular public key for login. Um, the options are uh, in front. Um, uh, it, it's a comma-separated list of values. Um, and then you have uh, an empty space. Uh, and then you have uh, the type of, of algorithm used for the public key. And then you have the public key in itself, and then you have a command. Okay, that's the format of, of the entry in authorized keys. Um, I, I shortened the public key here. And this, what I have written here, is, uh, is what I use for uh, the reverse proxy. Okay, so this is... This just allows the tunnel to get created and nothing else. You, you can go in the further options um, on, on in the man page. They are written quite clearly. So restrict is very restrictive. And everything that gets added in, in the future to the configuration, to the options, um, will get Added to restrict it as well. So this is a catch-all uh, statement, basically that um, that should prevent pretty much everything. Okay. So you have seen. Uh, I have some. Uh, I had some problems with uh, my keys. Um, well, I had this. I had this problem at work where I just couldn't SSH add my keys, and. I, I wanted you to um, get the solution quickly so you don't have to Google it for it. So I just uh, edited it to my presentation. Um, basically, you start the SSH agent in a, a subshell and then um, you can SSH add. Uh, you, uh, the changing of the uh, running uh, session, that's, I, I've shown you that before. Um, okay, but we have talked about tunnels and what happens, you create a tunnel and then the connection drops and then the tunnel gets broken and what, what you can do. Okay, um, you can um, install the software auto SSH or you can write a script that monitors the tunnel connection from cron and in case the connection is broken, kills it or 
basically restarts the connection, okay? So this can also help you in case you have a open WRT box at your parents' house maybe, and uh, there you have this uh, remote uh, port forwarding set up that you can call your parents in case something, something broke and say, okay, uh, power cycle the uh, router and then you should get a connection again, okay? It's, it's quite reliable. So here is the script I use. Um, you can take it and use it. Uh, it doesn't have too many safeguards. For instance, it doesn't check if actual data goes over the connection. It just does the tunnel and it doesn't check if the data actually is flowing, okay? So it, there is a situation uh, that can happen that you are not able to, uh, to connect even though the tunnel is still there. Yeah, tough, tough luck, but then still you can call your parents and say, okay, power cycle, because in five minutes you will get another tunnel. That should work. Also, this is set up for a drop bear. Uh, so this has some a, a bit different flags, and this is also set up in a such a way that basically every 20 uh, seconds a ping or, or basically a keep alive gets sent, and so that should uh, prevent your uh, NAT or firewall uh, from killing the, the session, the flow. Okay, we talked about tunnels and SOX proxies, and um, so what can you use this for, okay? Um, well, maybe the authentication window you have seen, this is what I get also on the servers. So, so I can, cannot easily do updates, or I would have to set up a repository at work and connect to this repository. But maybe I just want to install something ad hoc and don't want to think about stuff too much. Then, well, I could uh, write uh, the... I, I could connect to this uh, SOX proxy from apt or from uh, yum, and then uh, I would be able to install my packages as if I was um, unrestricted. Uh, and um, the thing here uh, at the bottom is um, you, can, you can either forward uh, the DNS requests uh, through the proxy as well or uh, keep it out. And that's the, the H that's missing on, on the, on the uh, bottom. So we still have some five minutes. I, I want to keep some time for your questions because nobody asked anything in between. And, um, but I, I want to uh, just for a short moment go over some of the other ideas that you might have or you, want, you might do with SSH. Well, uh, Pavel Dostal, uh, he spoke about uh, SSH as a Tor hidden service at uh, the last or the, um, the Linux Days uh, conference before the last. Um, in that, that is interesting. I have done that, but it wasn't too reliable for me. It always broke. I probably have done something badly with that. It isn't that convenient to set up because you basically have to set up Tor and then you have to set up uh, SSH uh, server as well to listen uh, there and it uses a SOX proxy um, in, in the background. So, and also the bandwidth is quite limited. I got from, on, on very good connections, I got just 200 uh, kilobytes, um, uh, which, which is barely sufficient for, I don't know, MP3 uh, playing. Um, for instance, if you are in China or somewhere where they have some other ideas about, about firewalls and internet access, uh, you can use OBFS proxy with SSH. That should basically hinder the deep packet inspection of those firewalls uh, from keeping you out of the internet. Um, I haven't tried that because I haven't been to 
such a regime. Yeah, but but maybe keep that in mind if you travel somewhere to Iran. On, yeah, uh, South Korea also limits uh, some uh, outbound connections, so maybe maybe it's usable there as well. Uh, maybe you have heard about Mosh, which is basically um, something like SSH, but over UDP, and it, what it does is um, you have to install the client and server, um, and it, what it does is it compares the contents of the shell on both ends and synchronizes that uh, very quickly with very small packets. So it has um, very good latency char characteristics. It also can keep up with uh, package loss well enough that you can even use it on uh, chi, chi, uh, chide trains. <laughs> and um, yeah, so maybe try that if you have unreliable connections on, on your commute. Or um, I have heard about people that use shell access over DNS. So what they do is they set up a DNS uh, server uh, in such a way that when you are in a hotel and they just have a, a DNS server that is accessible from the network, that you basically send DNS requests that get forwarded um, from the resolver to your authoritative server, and the content of those DNS requests is actually uh, the, the shell access, okay? So you can encapsulate a shell in DNS. I don't, I don't know if this has to do much with SSH, but I find it very intriguing because uh, you are on most of those hotel networks very, very much, um, uh, preve uh, it prevents you from logging in to all those portals and, and everything, and it still works. Uh, if in case you have d only the possibility of SSH going somewhere, then you and for some reason you need some very obscure stuff going on, then you could also set up OpenVPN over SSH because OpenVPN can communicate over TCP. It's a very bad idea, but in some cases it can. Um, it can enable you to do something which you otherwise would be unable to do, okay? Maybe you have some crazy industrial protocols running somewhere in the middle of nowhere and the only thing you have there is a jump host with SSH, and that's it. Yeah, then use OpenVPN over SSH, I guess. Or SS Shuttle might do the job, but uh, maybe the end host, uh, you are not able to install something there. It, it can be quite complicated. And I have also looked if I can, in 2019, do SSH FS on Windows, and yes, uh, that should work. So I'm, I'm happy that I don't have to set up Samba and all, all those things uh, for some simple file transfers, uh, I, I can probably do SSHFS. If, if you are interested, then uh, let me know and I'll, I'll keep you posted next week or something. Okay, uh, thank you for, for your attention and uh, I would like to uh, take your questions, uh, comments, anything. Okay, do we have any Question? I can take questions in Czech also, uh, and I'll translate it. For and you. what other languages do you speak? German? Uh, German well? would be fine. Ja, ne, mag sich etwas fragen? Ne, Also, wenn Sie etwas fragen möchten, dann gerne. Ich stehe zur Verfügung. So, first question from me: What was the abuse? Uh, what abuse? Yeah, well, uh, all those tunnels may actually get you in trouble with your sysadmin because maybe the company policy doesn't allow that. Also, the abuse part is mostly this slide, okay? <laughs> this is uh, rather not very nice. All right. 
Thank you very much. Any other questions still? We have still some time. But I see no questions here. So, at least we had the first, as far as I know, it was the first talk at InstallFest in English. So, applause for Adam. <laughs>